Good evening. It's time for us to get started tonight. Thank you for being here on a Wednesday night for our Bible study time. I only have one announcement on our prayer list to let you know about. Dean Buchanan, a former minister here, is under hospice care in Maryville, Tennessee, and we want to remember him and his family in our prayers. Upcoming activities to let you know about, the ladies' exercise class will not meet tomorrow. Brenda's not able to be here, so the ladies' exercise class will not meet tomorrow. We will be adopting a family for Christmas this year. The family has a mom, an elderly aunt, and four kids, and we are collecting to take up for Christmas for them, and we do that through our Bible classes. So if you have not had a chance to give, do that in Bible class. If you've got some questions about that, you can see Josh or Emily um, and we'll be happy to answer that. The elderly aunt is the primary caregiver in that family, so she is, is kind of taking care of everybody. The youth group and their mentors will have a Christmas party this Friday at 6.30 at the home of the Wilkerson's. Please bring a 5 to $10 gift, and if you need a ride, the bus will leave the building at 6 o'clock. And the high school youth group will be attending Evangelism University uh, you'll need to turn in your money by December 15th, and that cost is $40. If you've got more questions, see Josh or Emily. And if you're headed to CYC, you need to turn in your money by December 31st. That cost is $35. Lots of deadlines coming up for our youth group. And if you are headed to the youth group lock-in, that cost is free, but uh, there is a service project they're going to do and some supplies that they need for that. You can bring those, and that'll be December 31st at 8 p.m., and last until 6 a.m. the next morning, you can sign up in the lobby. Those are all the announcements that I've got for us tonight, leading us in our worship service. Josh Terry has our opening prayer. Leland Steely is our song leader. Jason Arvin has our devotional, and Will Salisbury has our closing prayer. If there's nothing further, let's start our Devo. Walking alone at evening. Hearing the skies afar, bidding the darkness come to welcome me, silver star. I have a great delight in the wonderful scenes above. Guiding His power and light is showing His truth and love. Over a home with God, a place in His force to rest. Sure in a safe abode with Jesus and Savior's love, where I'll be pure and whole and live with my God above, sitting alone at eve and dreaming the hours away, watching the shadows fall me now at the close of day, God in his mercy comes with his word he is drawing near, spreading his love and truth around me and Father, we're so thankful for this evening where we can come together and, and sing praises to your name, Lord, 
and to uh, hear a portion of your word uh, broken to us. We ask that you prepare our hearts as uh, we hear this message of your word. We ask that it takes root deep into us and that we can that we can um, produce much fruit from it, Lord. We ask that you be with those people that we meet every day that we're trying to uh, share your word with, whether it be through our deeds or our actions, we ask that you help them to, to see your grace and your kindness, Lord. We're so thankful for uh, the wonderful blessing of our teachers and for uh, them being prepared and uh, being able to open up your word and, and reveal more uh, facets of it to us. God, we ask that you uh, watch over us and keep us safe, and it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Good evening. Happiness. What is happiness? What is true happiness? I don't know any person on this earth that wouldn't want to experience true happiness. Something to think that they find happiness in things of this world. Let's look at Solomon. He had pretty well everything. He had every worldly possession, everything that a person would want. He had all kinds of wisdom. He had fame. He had power. But as he reflected upon these things, he realized there wasn't any true happiness in the material that he had. In fact, he got bored. Look at Ecclesiastes 1.9. What has been, it is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Solomon came to the realization that what really matters in life can bring about true happiness. You see, true, true happiness can only be found in the Lord, of course, and we learn about how happy this is by looking into God's Word. When a person gets to the point in their life when they can trust the Lord, it is at that point without a doubt, and we keep his commandments, that we can have confidence that we have something to look for beyond this life. But let's take a look at several reasons why every Christian should be able to find happiness in the Lord. First, we should be happy for the fact that we know that God in Jesus is our Savior. Could you imagine going through life without Jesus? Think about how sad life would be if we, with this short time that we have on this earth if we didn't have Jesus and know what is coming. We should also be happy that we live in a free country where it is possible to have access to Jesus and to know the knowledge of Christ. Hebrews 13.5, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content in such things as you have. For he himself has said, you will never leave or forsake you. For we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear, what can man do to me? The second way that we find happiness is the fact that we can pray to God and have confidence that he will do what is best for our problems and what we ask for. Again, we may not get every answer prayer or every prayer answered, but we have God that we can talk to. Just think, would it be sad to also know that all we can do is learn, but we can never talk to God. The third thing that we should, that would make us happy, that should make us happy, is studying the Word of God. There are many today who hardly ever open their Bible unless it is at church. And if this describes us, I, which I hope it doesn't, we're missing out on another source of happiness. Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. The word is blessed and it also defined as happiness. It doesn't matter how you're treated when we serve God because God is there for us. Our final reason this, more, this, this afternoon, this evening, why we should, why we can find true happiness in the Lord is we have forgiveness. We can be forgiven, and we can be forgiven of our sins. Romans 4, 7. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, and those sins are covered. 
Blessed is the man whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So several items we learned about happiness. Knowing the Lord, knowing that we can pray, studying God's word, serving the Lord, and having forgiveness of sin when we need it. If you have found that you are not happy in your Christianity, or if you have not yet become a Christian, let's reflect on these things. And if you need the prayers of this church or need anything, come as we together stand and sing. Beyond this land of parting, losing and leaving, far beyond the losses, darkening this and far beyond the taking and the bereaving, lies the summer land of bliss, land beyond, beyond so fair and things you have done today and all the blessings you have showered upon us. Please be with our teachers tonight as they teach your word to all the students here. And please be with everybody as we finish the week. And thank you most of all for Jesus. In his name, amen. amen. All right. Time for us to get started. I had a rock to it. I couldn't get it figured out. Thank you for being in Bible class tonight. We are collecting for a family for Christmas. We do that through our Bible class time. I'm going to start this around over here with John and just kind of pass it around. And if we can send it to the back on this side and then bring it up here and end with Jerry, he does a good job making sure I get that after class. So uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. And again, that's, if you would like to give, if you've already given, that's fine. If you'd like to give, that's great. It's okay. Uh, we'll be doing that through our Bible classes. So if you don't have it tonight, you can give another time. But that's a, a neat thing we do. If you haven't been with us for that, what we do, we collect this, and then our youth group goes, and they do a, a shopping trip. And they go shopping for this family. They've got sizes and different things, and they buy some stuff that is necessary and some stuff that is fun, and they make sure that they get a, a good Christmas this year, and then we get that delivered to the, the family. And so it, it's just something that we get a chance to do, and we're glad we get that opportunity to help out. We've been talking about the family of God and kind of wrapping everything up. And so if you've been in here on Wednesday nights, you know that we started out in Genesis and talked about being the people of God. We looked specifically at Abraham and how God chose Abraham and his descendants. But then we also said it wasn't just his biological descendants. God, through the sign of circumcision, said that, that anybody in Abraham's house could be part of the covenant. 
And so in the Old Testament, the people of God, they had that sign of circumcision. We followed that, you know, we followed God's people through the Old Testament, saw that they didn't always live up to what they uh, were supposed to. That being chosen by God didn't somehow make you extra holy or mean that you were better than anybody else. In fact, sometimes we saw people outside the covenant act better than those inside the covenant. It meant that God's working his plan. And we followed that all the way into the New Testament. We saw Jesus show up. He is the perfect Israelite. He did what Israel was supposed to do. He was a light to all the nations. And we saw Jesus after his death, burial, and resurrection even say to his followers, go into all the world, make disciples. And so that, that call went out to everyone. And then we looked in Acts and we saw the church begin to follow up on that. And they began right where they were. By the way, that's always a, a great uh, method of evangelism. The early church was right there in Jerusalem, and the first thing they did is shared with their neighbor. They shared the gospel with the people right around them. And so the, the church grew in Jerusalem. And then they shared with the people kind of nearby, but not right beside them. And, and so the church grew throughout Judea. And then they began to cross those lines, and they said, hey, we're, we shared the gospel with Samaritans. And finally, we saw Peter preach to Cornelius and his family, and the gospel spread to Gentiles. Gentiles had no Jewish roots whatsoever, no background in the Old Testament. And, and so we, we took a look at that because it created some problems in the early church that they had to wrestle with and, and kind of figure out. And, and so then we saw that, that as they began that, we saw in Acts 15 how they, they addressed that with that, that Jerusalem council. And finally, we said, okay, here's how the church began to live that out. And we started tracing through Paul's life. Paul was one who became convinced that you did not have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian. That being part of the people of God did not mean following that Old Testament. And Paul said, you know, we have this mission, and Jesus gave it to us, this mission to unify the world. Just like God intended back in Genesis, the church is supposed to bring unity to everyone. We find unity in the church. And for Paul, it is so critical to the gospel. He said, if we let division creep into the church, those lines that are all around us in society and culture, if we let that come into the church, he says, you fundamentally change the gospel. And so we started out looking at Galatians. And Paul, as he wrote Galatians, you know, he said there in chapter 1 and verse 6, I, I marvel, I'm shocked that you have so quickly begun to follow another gospel. And so what he says is because you, you've taken the gospel and, and what they'd done in Galatia, they had begun to accept this idea that, okay, we need to become a Jew and then we can become a Christian. Get circumcised and then you can get baptized. And Paul said, if you believe that, if you believe that Jesus is only a God for Jewish people, you got to become a Jew in order to become a Christian. That's what you're saying. Jesus is only a God for Jewish people. You've changed the gospel. You've changed the mission of Jesus. It's not go into all the world. It's go into all the Jews. And so everybody needs to become a Jew so that they can become a Christian. And Paul says that's not the gospel. And he specifically said, Peter fell into this trap. And so Paul says, you know, whenever you do that, you've missed out on how Jesus is the image of God. And Paul says, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories to illustrate this. This is kind of, I'm sum summarizing Galatians. So first off, he says, I need to tell you my story, and then I'm going to tell you a story about Peter. Paul says, first off, let me tell you my story. And remember, for the Galatia, for the Gentiles in Galatia, they might not have known Paul's story. They might have said, well, Paul, maybe you just don't like Jewish people. And he said, you don't understand. I'm the most Jewish guy you know. I, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He said, if you know my story, I grew up in Judaism. I went to all the right schools. I did all the right stuff. I checked all the right boxes. Paul said, in fact, I grew up in the conservative wing of Judaism. I was a Pharisee. And I was really good at it. And I was shooting up through the ranks. And, and everybody knew my name. I persecuted the church because they weren't Jewish. Paul says, you can never accuse me of being anti-Jewish. I was as Jewish as you can get. I loved God. I loved being a Jew. And Paul says, so what do you think it would take for me to become convinced that you don't have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian? Paul said, I'll tell you what it took. It took the word of Jesus himself. 
So he tells his story of how Jesus called him to be a disciple or an apostle. And he says, because of that, I am absolutely 100% convinced that this is how you become a Christian. And it doesn't involve surgery, and it doesn't involve Torah, and it doesn't involve sacrifice. It involves Jesus. And that's it. And Paul said, if you teach anything else, I'm telling you, you messed up on what Jesus said. You don't get to pick and choose Jesus' words. So Paul says, you need to know me, first off. I'm not anti-Jewish. I just really believe this is the truth. And then he says, I need to tell you another story. There was, there was an incident in Antioch. Antioch had become a hub for the, the church. And he said there was, a, there was an incident in Antioch. Antioch was the first really multi-ethnic church. When the gospel spread to Antioch, lots of Gentiles believed and lots of Jews believed. And the church at Antioch kind of got a name for itself. Man, there at Antioch, they're all worshiping together. They got this whole unity thing figured out. And when the leaders in Jerusalem heard about it, Peter said, I want to see this for myself. And so Peter went to Antioch. And, and he shows up in Antioch, and it was wonderful. And, and Peter had no problem, and he fit right in. They had a church meal, and Jews and Gentiles sat together at the church meal. And, and the Jewish folks, they wouldn't eat the food that wasn't kosher. They didn't mind that it was sitting on the table. They just didn't eat it. You, you know how that works, right? We do church socials and there's times you say, I, I don't eat that. We might, the, the closest we could come would be to a food allergy. You know, if you say, oh, I, I'm allergic to that, you just skip it and go on. But they had, the, they, had, they had fellowship meals and they were eating together and they were sitting together and talking Jews and Gentiles and it was beautiful. And Peter was right there with it. And Peter sends word back to Jerusalem and he says, man, this is amazing. And they said, oh, we're going to send more than just you, Peter. And they sent this whole delegation of Jerusalem Christians out to the church at Antioch. Now, these are all Jews. And some of them were part of that group that said, you got to become a Jew and then become a Christian. And they show up. And when they show up, now, I, I want you to picture this, okay? And then I'll, I'll read Paul's summary of it. They show up, and there's that big fellowship meal. And this group from Jerusalem, they go, and they get their own little table, and they sit off by themselves. And that's all Peter's friends from Jerusalem. He knows them. And he's been sitting with all these folks at Antioch all around, and, and Jews and Gentiles, he's been sitting together, and everybody knows, man, Peter's here. I got to imagine they asked Peter to preach, but I don't know. If Peter's in the audience, nobody else should stand up to preach but Peter. You know, he needs... But Peter's been talking to him. He knows this church. He's getting to know him. And then all his Jerusalem buddies show up and they sit at their own little table. And Peter goes over and he sits with them. And, and he gets up and, and maybe he's walking back and he's carrying his plate and some of the Gentiles are like, hey, Peter, sit down. We got to tell you something. He's like, and he just walks on by, you know. He won't sit at the table with the Gentiles. And they said, what's going on? And they said, Peter, we got to. And he's like, I, I can't talk to y'all right now. And he goes back to his Jerusalem crowd. And when Peter did that, there were some other folks in the church there that were Jews. And they, you know, at some point in that meal, they picked their plate up and they headed over to the Jerusalem table and they sat down. And all of a sudden, you got a bunch of Jews sitting on one side of the fellowship hall and a bunch of Gentiles sitting on the other side of the fellowship hall. And Paul sees that happen. And Paul decides he's had enough. These divisions, they're crawling into the church here, and he says, this isn't the church, this isn't the gospel, this isn't what Jesus said. Now that's David's version. Here's Paul's version. Galatians chapter 2, starting in verse 11. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face, because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, James was one of the elders in the church at Jerusalem, before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Paul says when Peter did that, he had influence. And people followed Peter's example. 
And they began to all just sit separated, Jews and Gentiles again. And he said these men came and they were of the circumcision. Again, these are Christians, but they're those Christians who believe you've got to be a Jew and then become a, Gen a Christian. And all the Jews started sitting together. And Paul says, that's a hypocrite, Peter. He calls it hypocrisy. Why is it hypocrisy? How's that hypocritical? Peter's teaching unity, but practicing dissension, John says, yeah. He stands up and he says, we're one in Christ, but y'all sit over there and we sit over here. We're all equal, but we can't sit together. So what Peter says and what Peter does don't add up. How else is it hypocritical? It's not just what he says on Sunday. It's how he used to act. I mean, it's not like Peter showed up and just did this and preached unity and sat with the Jews. Hey, last week before they got there, you sat right in the middle of all of us. We were all listening to that story about you walking on water. And then you weren't walking on water anymore. And Jesus said, we were all hearing that story. And now you won't sit with us? So Peter has clearly said... I'm more concerned about what these guys think than even what the Lord thinks. Because last week, God was with us. We were all at church, and I sat with you guys, but this week I'm not sitting with you because those guys are here. I value their opinion more than God's truth. And so Paul says, Peter, that's hypocrisy. You act as if keeping, you know, he says, you ought to either keep separate all the time or eat together all the time, but you can't flip back and forth One's true and one is an act. And so Peter, or Paul says, Peter, you're, you're acting, you're putting on a show. That's really what hypocrisy means. You're putting on a show one way or another. Either you showed up here and you really believe Jews and Gentiles need to be separate and you pretended like we were all one. And now when the folks from Jerusalem come, you, you're showing your true colors. Or maybe you showed up here and you really believe we're all one. But when the folks from Jerusalem show up, you put on an act, you put on a show that you say you keep a separation there. One of those is the truth and one of those is an act and you can't have both, Peter. So verse 14, when I saw they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you, being a Jew, live in a manner of the Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Notice what Paul says. Go back and look there at verse 14. When I saw they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. Paul says, Peter, the, the message you preach with your life, it's not straightforward. It means it's not in step. It, it's, that, uh, it's a military term. Now, I didn't serve in the military, but it comes from when the military would march together. And I was in marching band. And when we were in marching band, we learned to all be on step together. And you had to step out with the same foot and the same thing, and you wanted that whole line all the way across and all the way back. Everybody was on step. And I remember thinking, you know, does it really make a difference? And at some point, they would pull us out and let one of us kind of watch. And intentionally, somebody in the band would go off step. Boy, you could pick it out like that. It was so obvious. Everybody's head is bobbing in order, and here's somebody who's up when everybody else is down. Everybody puts their left foot out, and somebody puts their right foot out. And you can tell it immediately. They weren't straightforward. They weren't in step. You know who the only person who usually didn't know they were out of step? It was the person doing it. Yeah, yeah. Because I've been that person, you know, we're all marching along. David, wrong foot. Oh, sorry, I didn't know it. 
And Peter doesn't realize he's out of step. He's not stopped to think about it. Now, if I had stopped to look and said, oh, wait, I'm on the wrong foot, and that's what you're supposed to do, Peter's supposed to be checking himself against the truth of the gospel, and he's not, and so he's off step. And Paul calls him out, Peter, wrong foot. You're off step. You're not straightforward. And you're not in step with the truth of the gospel. It's like John said, he preached it, but he wasn't walking it. He preached freedom, but his actions preached there's a difference. We're not really free in Christ to fellowship one another. He says, basically, either it's okay or it's not, make up your mind. And notice what Paul says. This is not some debate about opinions. We're not wondering how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. We're not wondering if God can make a rock so big that he can't lift it. This is not a theological difference of, hey, do we need to meet and have church in the morning or in the evening? I think this, you think that kind of thing. Paul says, this is the gospel, and you messed it up, Peter. It was the gospel, and now it's not. And when you take those wrong steps, when you're not straightforward, Paul says, now you're, you're splitting off from the group. And remember, Paul's talking about unity here. And the more steps you take away from the group, at some point, you separate yourself from the group. If you've been with us on Sunday nights in 1 John, he talks about this group that went out from us. And he says, you know what? They left us. They separated from the group because they were never really of us. And, and John even says it's because they didn't understand Jesus as Christ. Here Paul says, Peter, you're on the wrong step and it's leading you away from the body of Christ. You've misunderstood. You're allowing division in the body of Christ. And Paul said, we can't do that. So here's what's at stake. Here's why this is such a big deal. If Jesus is king of all nations, and we don't usually use that phrase for Jesus. That's a Bible phrase, king of all nations. But we usually talk about king of kings and lord of lords. You know what that means? He's the king over all the kings of the world. He's lord over all the lords of the world. He's the president of presidents. He's the monarch of monarchs. He's king of all nations. If that's true, if he's a king of all nations, which means he's a king for all nations, then anybody can become a Christian. And if he's not, if he's only a Jewish king, then you've got to become a Jew in order to become part of his nation. And if you believe that all nations can become a Christian, if you believe the gospel is for all, then you can't enforce cultural markers, cultural identity parts on the people of God. Because if you do, then you have a different king than Jesus. Incidentally, this is where some folks have said, you know what, we don't identify as citizens of any nation we, we don't participate in government and all that. And, and you can analyze their arguments another day. There's some things to discuss there. But what they say is they think it's out of step for me to say I'm a Christian and fly an American flag or a British flag or an Iranian flag or a Russian flag. I, I can't be a part of some nation and the kingdom of God. When David Lipscomb wrote about all of his th thoughts on that matter, he said, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God, period, end of discussion. All Christians are citizens of the kingdom of God. Now, as he decided how to carry that out, that's how he applied it. But what he meant was all Christians should have their primary identity in the kingdom of God. And we talk about that as Christians. Paul's addressing a group of folks who talked about that looking as Jesus. His identity is king of all nations. And all of that points to why Paul considered it so important. Because if you say, well, you know what? In order to be a Christian, you got to be an American Christian. you got to do church America's way. You have a king other than Jesus now. 
Because now you have American Jesus, not King of all nations Jesus. In the same way, if you said you have to be a citizen of Israel, a Jew, now you have Jewish Jesus, not King of all nations Jesus. For Paul, Jesus is King of all nations, and faith in Jesus is the defining marker. Now, Paul says it really interesting. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Galatians chapter 3. I've summarized a lot of Galatians here. We're going to go down to the very end of Galatians chapter 3. Starting in verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Jews, Gentiles, you're all the children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So is everybody a child of God? Don't get ahead of me, JB. That's in verse 27. <laughs> in verse 26, he does give a marker, and JB's right, we're headed to one specifically. But in verse 26, he says, all of us are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. He says some people aren't children of God. Now, God as creator is father of us all, but this is not creation. This is a, a relationship, a covenant relationship, a family relationship. And he says the defining mark of being the family of God is faith in Christ Jesus. It's not circumcision. It's not any other ethnic marks. It is you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And now verse 27 he says, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That language of put on, it, it's like you've gotten dressed with Christ. It looks all the way back to Genesis when God covered the shame of Adam and Eve by, by creating some clothing for them. They put on God's clothes to cover their shame. If we have faith in Christ Jesus, we have put on Christ. It covers our shame and our guilt and our forgiveness is there in Christ. And Paul's going to go on. I'm going to come back to that identifying mark. In verse 28, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And then Paul drops the bombshell on them for them. And if you are Christ's, then you're Abraham's seed. And heirs according to the promise. What does he say about Gentile Christians? If you're Christ's, if you belong to Christ, well, he says you're neither Jew nor Gentile, but look at what he says in verse 29. That's the bombshell. A Gentile who becomes a Christian and says, I belong to Christ, they're Abraham's seed. You're in the family of Abraham. Man, for, for good Jews, that's almost blasphemy. You mean you can be part of the descendants of Abraham? You can be reckoned as the descendants of Abraham, heirs according to the promise. Now, if you've been with us on Wednesday nights, they would say, well, no, 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 no. That covenant was made to Abraham and his family. That was the promise Y'all go with me back to that promise. It was to Abraham and his family. And who else? His household. The people that weren't his biological children. They were included from the very beginning. In Genesis, they were wrapped in there. It's to you and to your children and to anybody in your household. Circumcision is the sign of the covenant. And Paul says... And Paul can say this as a good Jew. He's like, we missed it. We ran right past that. We thought it was all about Abraham and bloodlines, and they didn't know about DNA, but that's what they were looking at. If you could trace your daddy's, 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 daddy back to somebody in Abraham, well, if you're a Jew, it's actually through your mama. But 
If you can trace it all the way back, then you're a descendant of Abraham. And Paul said, what if you trace it back and it goes back to Abraham's servant who got circumcised as a sign of the covenant, was part of his household. <laughs> if you're Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. There's a new way, if you will, to be a child of Abraham. And he goes through a lot of things that don't matter anymore. Jew and Gentile, that doesn't matter anymore. Your, your religious upbringing, that doesn't matter anymore. If you learned the law or you didn't learn the law growing up as a kid, that doesn't matter anymore. Your ethnicity, that doesn't matter anymore. Slave or free, you're standing in society. That doesn't matter anymore. How much power you have in society, it doesn't matter anymore. If you're a somebody or a nobody, it doesn't matter anymore. Male and female, gender doesn't matter in Christ anymore. You don't have to be a man or have a man in order to count in the kingdom of God. Men and women are equally welcome. And he picks on three big issues in that culture. Those were, oh, that was it, okay? Interestingly enough, the issue really is the first one here, Jew and Greek. That's the, the big issue. But the others, he says, they apply as well. Paul wants them to understand unity applies in lots of other areas as well. So if there was some church that said, hey, if you're a slave, you have to sit in the slave section of the auditorium. You can't sit with the rest of the folks. Paul would write a letter just like this to them. If there's some church and they said, now women sit here, men can sit here. Paul would write a letter just like this to them. And he'd say, you can't let those divisions creep into the church. The principle of unity in Christ, it governs how Paul sees the church. So here's the thing that the church struggles with and wrestles with. It was easy. Under Jewish law, For it was easy to know who was in and who was out. You spoke the right language. You used all the right code where you could say, hey, I've been circumcised. You might have the, the phylacteries, those scripture boxes on your wrist or, or even on your head or whatever. You had certain cultural markers that people could look at and say, you're one of us. So how do you know who's a Christian? What are the markers that count? And Paul says there's only one thing that matters. That's it. It's faith in Christ Jesus. That's the defining quality, period, of God's people. Now today, we have a discussion a lot of times that Paul wasn't having in his day. And when we read these verses, we key in on something that Paul actually uses as an aside. Paul says, I want you to understand, it is faith in Christ Jesus. It is putting on Christ that unites us all. And he says, you guys can all go back to your baptism. Everybody remembers the day you got baptized. Everybody remembers that's the day you became a Christian. It's the common experience that all Christians share. And for Paul, he just throws it out there because it was the assumption it was how everybody became a Christian. Today we discuss that a lot more. Today there's folks who are like, hey, I don't know about baptism. I like Jesus, but I'm not. And in Paul's day, he can just say, church, it's faith in Christ Jesus. You know, when we were all baptized, we all proclaimed, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That unifies all of us. We've all been baptized into Christ. We've all put on Christ in baptism. And so for Paul, that's one of the markers. Now, Paul's going to say, anytime you take a marker of any type and exalt it, you get it out of place. You lose the priority of faith in Christ Jesus. 
If you've heard me talk about baptism, you've heard me tell my church camp story. Growing up at church camp, we used to play baptism. During boys' swim time, we played baptism, and it was a ton of fun. You'd come up behind some boy, and if you were really sneaky, you'd just grab him. And, and if you were sneaky, you could kind of haul him down under the water, and you could say, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and boom, I got another baptism. Now, if you were strong and he wasn't, but he knew you were coming, you'd just pick him up and body slam him into the pool. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I got two baptisms. You could baptize the same guy five times. I know, because I got baptized a lot. I was scrawny. We had a ton of fun. We got a lot of people wet. We didn't save a single soul. And we were little kids. There was some value in us learning. I mean, we learned, man, baptism is by immersion. We learned baptism is in the name of the Father, the Son. We learned some things. But I do remember our counselors always stopping to talk to us about that that was a game we played. And it wasn't really baptism. What does it take to make baptism more than just getting you wet? Confession? There's got to, what's that? Faith, yeah. I, I got to make that confession that says, I believe Jesus is the Christ. Yeah, Paul would just say, you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. If there's no Jesus... And no death, burial, and resurrection. You can get dunked all you want. You can say all the magic words you want, and you're still just as lost. And if there is Jesus, and his death, burial, and resurrection is for everybody, and you don't believe it, you can get dunked as many times as you want. You know what you get? Wet. Whatever meaning baptism has has to be tied to faith in Christ Jesus. And so Paul says, if all of a sudden you just go around and start dunking people, well, he would say, you've messed up. Now, he doesn't say that because that wasn't an issue for them. But that's his point here. There's no meaning without faith. But by the same token, an adult male who wanted to become a Jew had to get circumcised. If you snuck up behind some Gentiles, knocked them in the head, and did surgery on them, guess what? They're not Jewish. They're just mad. Because there's no faith. Circumcision didn't save anybody. It wasn't some magic ritual. You know, that's how magic works. Magic works when I do and say all the right stuff. The spell works on you whether you like it or not. But salvation is not a spell that we cast on somebody. Righteousness is not magic. It's through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, it's important if I say, man, I got faith in Christ Jesus, well, what am I going to do? Exactly what he told me to do. There is an obedience. And, and so for Paul, he's going to talk about that, that waters of baptism. We, we've all the one, we're all the ones who've been baptized into Christ. We put on Christ. And in the waters of baptism, all those other differences were washed away. In Paul's mind, if you're a human, you're qualified to be a Christian. If you're breathing, you can become a Christian. Jesus is king of all nations. You're qualified to join the Messiah and his people. And it doesn't look like becoming a Jew. It doesn't look like joining any country anywhere. It's being clothed with Jesus. You put him on in baptism, but now Paul's not going to just stop there. He goes on in Galatians, and, and he talks to them, and he says, Hey, I, I'm concerned about you. I want to make sure that you follow up in the faith. And so he says, There's some things you need to know about living as a Christian life, the Christian life. And so in Galatians chapter 5, he says, if I walk with Jesus, if I put on Christ in baptism, here's what that looks like. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
Against such there is no law, and those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Paul says, if you're a Christian, yeah, it looks like here's how, you, here's how we all became a Christian. We were baptized into Christ. And if you're a Christian, here's what it looks like to live as a Christian. And if your life is not marked by love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, there's nine, I got them all, good. Then something's wrong. That's the mark of being a Christian. And it's not, am I a good American Christian or a good South African Christian or or a good Canadian Christian? Because those aren't the lines we follow. It's, am I producing the fruit of the Spirit? And while we have that common experience of baptism, that shouldn't be the only common experience we have. Paul would say we ought to be able to tell some stories of, you know what? Jesus in me has made me more loving than I ever thought I could have been. Jesus in me has made me a kinder person. Being clothed with Christ has given me patience that I would have told you was impossible for me to ever have. You see, the emphasis for Paul is is being in Christ. We tend to look for those identifying marks, and we tend to want to create a list. And Paul would say, as soon as you create a list, you've messed it up. Being in Christ, faith in Christ, that's the number one thing. So that's why as church, we have, to be, we have to constantly evaluate. What do we think a Christian is? What do we think it looks like to be a Christian? And we need to be asking ourselves, is that a Bible marker or is that a cultural marker? Is that something that we've had in our time as a marker that maybe doesn't apply anymore because times have changed? You know, what do Christians wear or what do they not wear? That changes with times. How do Christians wear their hair? That changes with culture. It changes with where you are. Christianity is a movement with a clear core, but it is so flexible that it applies to all people everywhere and every when. That's the unity Paul has in mind for us. And you can't contain it to just one group of folks. We'll kind of wrap things up next week. Thanks so much for being in Bible class tonight.